Vallejo Police Department. I want to report a double murder. Yeah, I have your if you name, go one mile you east me? on Columbus Parkway, the public park, go find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Good. No one knew that after this call on the summer night of July 4, 1969, one of the most massive series of police investigations in the history of the United States was about to begin. This is the unsolved mystery of the Zodiac Killer. In 1968, just before the holidays, David Faraday, a 17-year-old student at Vallejo High School, and Betty Lou Jensen, who was just 16 at the time, were on their first date. The plan was simple, to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan High School, but things took a different turn. They instead spent the evening visiting a friend, and as the night deepened, they drove to Lake Herman Road. remote lover's lane, arriving around 10.15 p.m. The couple parked in a quiet and dark area just off the side of the road. Little did they know they were not alone. A few minutes later, they heard a loud engine sound coming right behind them. It was a strange car that parked beside them and rolled its windows down. The oddly looking man inside ordered them to exit their vehicle. David tried to confront him, but the individual drew a 22 caliber pistol and fatally shot the boy in the head. Panicked, Betty got out of the car and started running. But after just 10 meters, she got shot five times in the back, killing her on the spot. The killer then disappeared. On Independence Day, 18-year-old Darlene Ferran and 16-year-old Michael Majot left their house and entered their car, planning to buy fireworks for celebration. Shortly after leaving their driveway, they noticed they were being followed. Terrified, Darlene tried to lose the follower with quick turns, but within 10 minutes they were trapped in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park. As they parked, the follower stopped to the left of Darlene's vehicle and then abruptly left. They felt a momentary sense of relief, but it was short-lived. Five minutes later, the car came back this time stopping right behind them. A man got out, holding a flashlight. Thinking it was a policeman, the couple reached for their IDs. The man pointed the bright flashlight into their eyes, blinding them, and then fired more than seven times at the young couple. The killer started walking back to his car, unaware that Michael was still conscious, but in pain, the boy let out an agonizing moan. Upon hearing Michael's groan, the man turned around and came back, firing two more bullets. It was at that moment that Mike jumped into the back seat. Thinking the job was finished, the killer vanished. Luckily, three teenagers celebrating stumbled across the scene and alerted police immediately. Like a miracle, Michael was still alive, and he would go on to describe the full face of the Zodiac Killer. On the foggy night of August 1, 1969, an enigmatic figure known as the Zodiac Killer initiated his haunting game with the media by sending cryptic letters to three major newspapers in San Francisco, the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. The messages, written in almost indecipherable handwriting, began with a startling confession. Dear editor, I am the killer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl on July 4th near the Vallejo golf course. He proved his claim with details known only to the police and himself. Each message contained a part of a mysterious code, along with a dire warning. Print the code, 
or face a killing spree. The conclusion featured a bizarre array of symbols, including Greek letters and Morse code, creating a complex puzzle. The urgency of the threat led the Times Herald and Chronicle to promptly publish their segments of the code. The examiner, however, wrapped in skepticism, delayed their publication until Sunday. The code's complexity attracted the attention of top codebreakers from the Navy, NSA, and CIA, who found themselves stumped by its intricacies. In the midst of this atmosphere of fear and intrigue, Donald and Betty Harden, amateur puzzle enthusiasts, managed to crack the Zodiac's cryptic message. It read, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild animals in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all the people I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collection of slaves for my afterlife. Yet, the Zodiac's disturbing communications didn't cease with this revelation. Merely three days after the Hardens deciphered his message, he dispatched another letter, providing further gruesome details about his actions and reinforcing his identity as the Zodiac Killer. This spurred the public to analyze every aspect of his communications, with particular focus on the jumbled letters at the end of the first cipher, which some speculated might conceal his real name. However, the true meaning of these letters was uncertain. As the public remained fixated on uncovering his identity, the Zodiac maintained his presence of terror, and he was about to strike again. On September 27, 1969, college students Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were having a picnic at Lake Berryessa when she noticed a man walking towards them. Cecilia mentioned it to Brian, but he dismissed it as nothing at that time. He thought that she was just seeing someone staging at the picnic area, but that was normal because it was a public park. The man then went behind a tree and began to go even closer to them. At one point, Cecilia could see that the man held a pistol and got up in panic. Brian followed. The Zodiac pointed a gun, demanding the couple's money and car key so he could drive to Mexico. As of this moment, they thought they were being robbed and not in actual danger for life, but they couldn't be more wrong. Brian pulled his car keys and only 50 cents out of his pockets and handed them to the man. He later told police that the man pocketed the 50 cents and then tossed the car keys back to the couple, at which point the man put his gun back in the holster on his waist. The man told the couple that he was an escaped convict from Deer Lodge, Montana, and that he had killed a prison guard to escape. He also claimed that he had already stolen a car, but it was, quote, too hot. After explaining himself, the man pulled out a three-foot clothesline and instructed Cecilia to tie Brian's hands. After Brian was tied up, and the man proceeded to tie up the girl's hand. At this point, Brian recalls the man saying, I'm going to have to stab you people. He proceeded to stab Cecilia 10 times and Brian six times. After believing he had finished the job, the man left the scene and hiked. Five hundred yards to the couple's car, and with a black felt tip pen, he wrote on the car door, Vallejo, December 20th, 68, September 27th, 69, 6.30 by knife. He then drove to a phone booth, 27 miles away, and at 7.40 p.m., he placed a call to the Napa Police Department. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carman gear. I'm the one who did it. The couple, who were both still conscious, were found by a fisherman and his son and were taken to the hospital. And at 7.40 p.m. on the same day, much like the last murder, the Zodiac called into the Napa County Sheriff's Office to report his crime. Cecilia later died from her wounds, but Brian survived to explain the ordeal to the police and press. 
By now, the police were starting to see similarities in the Zodiac's murders. The Zodiac mostly targeted couples of young students. Two of the attacks were right before holidays, and the others all happened on weekends. Usually, the killings would happen after nightfall or dusk. The murderer would frequently boast in calls or letters about the killings he had committed. Most of the killings happened in famous Lover's Lane 6. All of the killings happened in or near automobiles, and ultimately, every homicide occurred close to a body of water. The authorities discovered several patterns that pointed to several possible explanations for his bizarre killings. Because most of the victims were couples, the Zodiac was maybe frustrated with couples or love, and potentially could hold a specific hatred for women because in the last two murders, the focus for most of the damage was on the woman, causing them to die in both cases, but leaving the men to survive. But with his next and final confirmed murder, the Zodiac would break this pattern. On October 11th, 1969, two weeks after his prior crime, the Zodiac entered Paul Stein's cab around 9.30 p.m., directing to Washington and Maple Street in Presidio Heights. The cab, under confusing circumstances, halted a block further, perhaps on the killer's request. Once stationary, he seized Stein's collar, shot him in the head, then shifted to the front seat, procured the driver's wallet and a shirt fragment, subsequently exiting the scene. At the same time, two teens witnessed the event from their window across the street and immediately alerted the police. Their description of the Zodiac as a black male proved wrong, allowing him to escape that night. This was because, in the dead of night, a police patrol unit reached the scene and saw a man, quote, lumbering along in the fog. This was later determined to most likely have been the Zodiac. But since this man was white, the police didn't stop him and only asked him if he had seen anything unusual in the area, to which the man responded that he had seen someone waving a gun around a couple blocks to the east. At which point did the patrol unit speed off in that direction? If the police had stopped the man or come any closer, they would have seen that the man's jacket was drenched in Paul Stein's blood. At the scene, police uncovered a partial fingerprint in the cab, affirming Zodiac's identity. The teens, rectifying their initial error, aided in developing a more accurate police sketch of the murderer. On October 14th, three days later, the Zodiac mailed the Chronicle a letter, including a bloodied shirt piece, affirming his involvement. The letter, which mocked the police, concluded with a threat to assault a school bus. The publication in the newspaper triggered widespread alarm. Napa Valley Unified School District briefed bus drivers on emergency protocols. Despite the panic, the attack never happened. A second sketch of the man was made, making him older and his jaw thicker. This sketch was then circulated to the public, replacing the original. With his letters in full swing and the San Francisco area in the palm of his hand, the Zodiac did something that shocked everyone throughout the country. At the end of the month, on October 22nd, the Zodiac called the Oakland PD and asked to speak to Melvin. Belly was a prominent lawyer at the time. He said he wanted the lawyer to appear on a TV talk show so that the Zodiac could call in and talk to him on the air. In the talk show, the Zodiac was referring to was the Channel 7 talk show, which usually started at 7 a.m. but began half an hour early that day. After waiting for 40 minutes on the air for the Zodiac to call in, the telephone finally rang but hung up almost immediately. The next call came in at 7.20 a.m. This time he stayed on the call for longer, and after being asked if he had any other name other than Zodiac, the man said Sam. Talk to us. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam, please. I have headache. How long have you had those headaches, Sam? In a long time? Since I killed a kid. If, if it all boils down to the question of you're giving yourself up, if you could be assured that you wouldn't get capital punishment for myself. I don't want to give myself I, up. Huh? I want to kill those kids. 
Bill, I finally arranged to meet Zodiac in Daly City, a suburb south of San Francisco, to talk in person. The attorney waited in an office building, but Zodiac never showed. I asked Belli if he thought the man who called really was the Zodiac killer. I can't. Negative. I, I, I can't say. All I can say is this man needed help. This man seemed like a man who was coming up to a storm or to a climax. And th th this very blood-curdling thing. Children kill and then the sort of an agonized cutoff. The Zodiac called the show a total of 35 times but only 12 of them were heard on air. But people were still hesitant about whether this caller was really the Zodiac. To confirm, the only three people who had ever heard the Zodiac's real voice, Nancy Slova, who was the telephone operator on duty when the Zodiac claimed responsibility for the murders, David Slate, who was the police officer who had seen the Zodiac the night of the cab driver murder, and Brian Hartnell, the survivor of the Lake Berryessa stabbing, was brought in to verify the voice in the calls. All of them agreed that the voice they had heard was much deeper and older than the one in the calls. Further investigation discovered that the calls were actually made from the Napa State Hospital by a mental patient, effectively proving that the Zodiac was not the one making the calls. In the following weeks, the Zodiac would send two more letters, boasting about two more murders. In the first letter, there's a card that reads, Sorry, I haven't written, but I just washed my pen. On the inside, it reads, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh. Before you hear the bad news, you won't get the news for a while yet. P.S. Could you print this new cipher on your front page? I get awfully lonely when I'm ignored, so lonely I could do my thing. This letter also contained another cipher, and since his last one had been cracked in a day, the Zodiac decided to make this one considerably more challenging, now known as the Z340 cipher. This cipher remained unsolved for over 50 years until December 2020 when an international group of three amateur codebreakers used computer software to finally crack the Z340 cipher. This cipher requires the letters to be substituted, read diagonally, rearranged, and flipped, while also skipping certain words. It was due to the complex nature of the cipher that it remained unsolved for so long. But once it's finally decoded, it reads, I hope you are having lots of fun trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a good point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber. The letter continues and says that he will have his slaves work for him in the afterlife, a belief that he expressed in his first letter back in 1969. Although the letter doesn't give us any clues as, as to who the Zodiac was, it does confirm that it was not the Zodiac who called into Melvin's show. Not only that, but it also confirms that the Zodiac keeps up with his own publicity and, in fact, watching the show. The second letter the Zodiac sent in 1969 read, This is the Zodiac speaking. Up until the end of October, I had killed seven people. I have grown rather angry with the police for their lies about me, so I shall change the way I collect my slaves. I shall no longer announce to anyone when I commit my murders. They shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, a few fake accidents, etc. The police will never catch me because I have been too clever. For them. The letter goes on to list some facts that the police departments got right and wrong. In a seven-page rant, the Zodiac states that the police sketch that was circulated is correct, but quote, the rest of the time, I look entirely different. He also states that, contrary to what the police say, he never left fingerprints at his murders. He says that he's been leaving fake clues at his murders to quote, keep the cops happy. He then goes on to describe the moment when he got stopped by police after the cab murder. P.S. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up. And one of them called me over and asked me if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five, ten minutes. And I said, yes, there was a man waving a gun and the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner. 
after he recapped his encounter with the police. The Zodiac wrote step-by-step -step instructions on how to create a bomb with household items. But the following sentence caught investigators' attention. The Zodiac writes, What you do not know is whether the death machine, bomb, is at the site or whether it is being stored in my basement for future use. If the Zodiac was telling the truth that he had a basement, it would drastically reduce the list of possible locations where the Zodiac lived. First, the Zodiac having a basement means that he lives in a house and not an apartment building. And second, basements aren't that common in the Bay Area. So either the Zodiac didn't live in the Bay Area, or in revealing that he had a basement, he had made a possibly fatal mistake. On the evening of March 22, 1970, Kathleen Johns went on a routine journey to Petaluma to visit her sick mother, accompanied by her 10-month-old baby. Her route took her on the less frequented Highway 132. As midnight approached, she noticed a strange presence, a vehicle trailing her in the darkness. In an attempt to defuse the situation, Kathleen slowed down, hoping the car would pass. Instead, the driver began honking and flashing headlights. Concerned about stopping on such a deserted road, Kathleen continued driving, hoping the driver would desist. But the car only became more persistent, accelerating to pull alongside her. The man inside gestured towards her rear tire, indicating a problem. Despite her unease, Kathleen pulled over on the freeway. The man insisted her rear tire was wobbling and offered to fix it, claiming he had the necessary tools. With reluctance, she accepted his help. After he appeared to have fixed the tire, they both set off again. Moments later, as Kathleen merged back onto the freeway, her rear tire completely detached. The same man reappeared, now offering to drive her to a gas station. Kathleen accepted. However, instead of heading to a gas station, the man drove past several exits and onto remote, rocky roads. The situation became increasingly tense, and Kathleen's fear escalated as the man broke the silence and said, Before I kill you, I am going to throw your baby out the window. Her heart dropped. She knew the only way to survive in this situation was by jumping out of the car. A few moments later, she seized an opportunity. Just when they stopped at a stop sign, Kathleen jumped from the car, rolling into a nearby ditch. The man searched briefly, but eventually left. Bruised but alive, Kathleen waited until a driver stopped and took her to the closest police star tie-on. There, after describing her ordeal and seeing a police sketch, she identified her abductor as the Zodiac Killer. They later found her car abandoned and burned, presumably by the Zodiac to destroy evidence of the night's events. Around a month later, on April 19, 1970, the Zodiac sent another letter and cipher. The letter read, This is the Zodiac speaking. By the way, have you cracked the last cipher I sent you? My name is... Followed by a 13-character cipher that, when decoded, is supposed to contain the Zodiac's name. But because the cipher is only 13 characters long, it is nearly unsolvable. There have been thousands of possible solutions to the cipher, but there is no way of knowing whether any of them are correct. The letter continues with the Zodiac claiming he's killed 10 people to date and that he would have killed more, except the bomb he was going to use was a dud. The second page of the letter shows a diagram of his new and improved explosive and how it works. Of course, the newspaper and the authorities kept any mention of a bomb threat hidden from public knowledge in order to prevent panic. In the next four years, around eight Zodiac letters were sent to the Chronicle, containing much of the same information and pleas for attention as his previous letters. One more cipher was sent, and when deciphered, it apparently contained the location of a bomb that would go off in the fall of 1970. The explosive was never found or detonated. In one of these letters, the Zodiac claimed responsibility for Kathleen John's abduction confessing that he lit her car on fire after failing to kill her. His final letter was sent on January 30, 1974, 
and seemed to review the movie The Exorcist before once again demanding publicity. At the end of the letter, the Zodiac's final score was written. Me 37, SFPD 0. Police had only confirmed five murders and two attempted murders from the Zodiac so his claim of 37 murders could very well just be an exaggeration. The Zodiac did say previously in a letter, though, that he would not continue announcing his murders, and he would make them look like accidents, meaning the final murder count could technically range anywhere from 5 to 37. Arthur Lee Allen, a complex figure with a troubled history, became a central suspect in the Zodiac case largely due to Donald Cheney's allegations, made after Allen was charged with child molestation. Donald described conversations where Allen mentioned killing people, attaching a flashlight to a gun for accuracy, and calling himself Zodiac. This moniker, supposedly inspired by his Zodiac brand watch, was particularly chilling given the killer use of symbols. Allen's interest and background raised eyebrows. His fascination with the book, The Most Dangerous Game, which involves human hunting, paralleled the Zodiac's sadistic games. His knowledge of cryptology was considered significant, given the Zodiac's complex ciphers. Physically, Allen fit the general description of the murderer, a large, imposing man with a similar hairline and glasses. He lived near several attack sites and was reportedly in Riverside when Sherry Jo Bates was murdered. His absence from work following the Bates murder added to the suspicion. Despite these links, critical forensic evidence failed to connect Allen to the Zodiac. None of his DNA, fingerprints, or palm prints matched those found at Zodiac crime scenes. The handwriting analysis of the letters also did not match. Conflicting eyewitness accounts from Zodiac survivors further complicated the matter. Allen's death in 1992 left many questions unanswered, with some investigators still convinced of his guilt, while others doubted the connections. Richard Gajkowski's link to the Zodiac case originated from the claims of Goldcatcher, a former colleague who suggested Gajkowski's involvement. Richard, an editor of a counterculture newspaper in San Francisco, was in the city during the Zodiac murders. His role in the counterculture movement was seen as potentially aligning with the Zodiac's anti-establishment messages. Goldcatcher alleged that Gajkowski had a deep knowledge of guns and cryptology, possibly acquired during his military service as a medic. This background was deemed significant due to the military-grade boot prints found at Zodiac crime scenes and the killer's use of military terms in his letters. A key piece of circumstantial evidence was the tentative identification by Nancy Slover, the police dispatcher who heard the Zodiac's voice. Slava indicated that a voice recording of Gajkowski was similar to the killer. Additionally, the cipher containing Geik was speculated to be a cryptic reference to Gajkowski. Despite these intriguing connections, the case against him was hampered by the lack of direct evidence and the questionable credibility of Goldcatcher's claims. Gajkowski's military records were mostly destroyed in a fire leaving gaps in his documented history. The absence of physical evidence linking Gajkowski to the Zodiac crimes made his candidacy as the killer controversial among experts. The theory implicating Earl Van Best Jr. as the Zodiac killer was propelled by Gary Stewart in his book, The Most Dangerous Animal of All. Stewart, who discovered Van Best Jr. was his biological father, argued that Van Best Jr. possessed the knowledge and traits consistent with the Zodiac, including a resemblance to the composite sketch and an interest in ciphers and codes. Stewart's claims initially gained traction with a handwriting analysis that seemed to match Van Best Jr.'s writing with the Zodiacs. However, this evidence was later discredited when it was revealed that the handwriting analyzed belonged to the minister who officiated Van Best Jr.'s marriage, not Van Best Jr. himself. Critics of Stewart's theory highlighted several inconsistencies, including the timeline of Van Best Jr.'s activities and his actual locations during the Zodiac killings. Despite the initial intrigue, the lack of substantial evidence, and these discrepancies, 
Many in the Zodiac research community dismissed Van Best Jr. as a credible suspect. Wrapping up the tale of the Zodiac Killer, I find myself in a similar state of skepticism. The suspects we've explored are certainly intriguing, each with their own compelling yet circumstantial connections to the case. Yet none provide conclusive evidence, leaving us in a realm of speculation and doubt. Considering the vastness of California during that era, teeming with diverse and often untraceable individuals, the real Zodiac could have been anyone. A face in the crowd, an overlooked passerby, seamlessly blending into the fabric of society. In the end, the Zodiac's true identity might forever remain an elusive shadow in the dark alleys of unsolved criminal history. Thank you.